We're on. Okay. Hello. Um, welcome to New Vocation, the resource adoption program here at Merriworth Farm in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, my name is Anna Ford, and I'm the program director for the program. And um, this is our third tour, I believe, right, Leandra? Yep. Um, and we started these virtual tours um, for a couple of reasons, but the main reason uh, was because we've joined Horse Country Tours. And this month, we were officially launching our tours. And obviously, due to the COVID and all the lockdown restrictions, um, we've had to postpone those. Um, what we thought was going to be just a couple um, tours is now going to be through the end of the month. So we thought, instead of just doing the same thing every week, we would break it down a little bit. And so we're breaking it down to four different parts of the series. The first one's going to be, we're going to cut, which today, we're going to cover the history of new vocations. The second one, we're going to talk about our rehab program. Um, the third one, we'll talk about the transitional training. And then the last one, we'll talk about our adoption process. So today we're going to get started with the history. And um, you might hear some of the horses are <laughs> a little excited. We were trying to get the horse over here's attention because I wanted to talk about him. Now they all think it's um, dinner time. Uh, <laughs> So now they all think it's dinner time, so it's my fault. I'll take one. The drink. This is the fellow I wanted to have his attention, and he's being a little grumpy, but. Um, he was napping. We'll come <laughs> Let's up. Let's come down to this guy. We'll come back to you, Zacharina. Yeah. What you do? I'll be young. Yum. Camera. <laughs> So just a brief background on New Vocations history. Um, the program was started in 1992 um, by Doc Morgan, who happens to be my mom. And um, the story goes like this. Um, she and my, and my dad um, owned, a farm in, owned a farm in Ohio, and my dad's a Santa Barbara trainer. And my mom would run the breeding um, farm operations. And she also was highly, highly involved in the 4-H program there in her area. They're all going to do this. And um, one day, there was a van that arrived to, I don't know if they were picking up or delivering a standard bread to their farm. And my mom jumped into the van to see what other horses were on the van. And so um, when she did that, she noticed that there was a couple beautiful thoroughbreds on the van, and um, she asked the van driver, you know, where, where are these guys going? Probably somewhere to a horse like this one right here. And um, <laughs> maybe not saying yes. And so um, she basically asked, you know, where are they going? And the van driver said, oh, these are free thoroughbreds. They're all being given away. Um, and she said, what? They're being given away? Why are they being given away? And um, she said, well, or the van driver said, they're being given away because when they're done racing, their owners only need them for racing, and they, you know, if they can't race any longer, um, then they just give them to whoever will be interested in taking them. And so my mom, who was a 4-H advisor at the time and was involved with a lot of the um, people riding in our community, was just amazed that a horse like this would be given away and she had all these really great riders that were uh, looking for nice horses that maybe couldn't afford them and so that is where new vocation started and she figured out the whole concept of hey if we can be the middleman for these horses if we can help the racing industry rehome them and repurpose them give them some skills and then we can put them up for adoption for a very reasonable fee, then we can help these horses not only get great homes, but we can help people who are looking for extremely quality horses um, be able to afford one of them. So let's walk down to Zapparini, who's the one that was causing <laughs> the ruckus earlier. I'm starting to The reason I wanted to talk about Zapparini <laughs> here is because he's a stakes winner. Um, he's a very successful racehorse. Yes, you were, weren't you? And um, he won $260,000 at the racetrack. And 
he was sold or purchased, I guess you would say, for 120,000, which is amazing that a horse that at one point was valued at 120,000 is now available for adoption for $1,000 or less. And so that same concept that thought started is trying to find, you know, be that middleman for the horses so that they can find homes, and not only that they can find homes, but for the average person to have a quality horse it still exists today, and that's what we do here. So let's walk on down the barn. I'll share a little bit more. I have a photo I wanted to show. Who is Zaffarini from? Who is he? Who donated him? Yeah. Um, I know Michael Dub was the main partner on him. There was a partnership group that he was with. Well, let me show you this photo. This is something that's very historical in our, or very part, of, very much a part of our history. These are the, this is a sign that Dot made, obviously handmade. She didn't have um, Photoshop back then to create things. And this sign was actually posted at Beulah Park, um, what's now Belterra, it was River Downs and Thistle Downs. Um, and she posted these at the racetrack, and this is where she got her first 20 horses is through posting signs like this across um, the Ohio tracks. And as you can see, it's still the same concept. Now, we're a little bit more politically correct these days, <laughs> but our marketing is pretty much the same is that we want to make sure that we can service the racing industry by providing their horses with quality care, transitional training, and rehoming services. So. This, actually, the, the original sign is going to be posted in our viewing room, which is where we'll be starting most of our tours um, starting in May. So, a little part of history there. We'll move down to the way here. We currently have a lot going on. Um, we have, <laughs> I want to walk out here and see what's going on here at the farm. Our fences are being painted today, which is the background noise you're probably hearing. And what you're seeing now is just a little bit of the surrounding fields um, where the horses are turned out. The horses that are out during the day are newer horses, but the majority of the horses that we have right now are all going out at night, which is why the fields are kind of empty. sticker, OTTB, and highly sought after hand sanitizers that we've had made, which are unicorn purebreds. So if anyone can put in their message in the message area um, what city or, or town our second facility was um, started, you'll be the winner of that. So we'll be following that. Please ask questions as we go along too. I forgot to mention that. So, like I said, in 2002, we, we went with the concept of we are taking in both thoroughbreds and standardbreds, and we decided that we would then go on to have two facilities, one to service thoroughbreds and one to service standardbreds, and that really started the growth of our program. Um, that was 2002, and from there, we've grown into multiple facilities from here in Kentucky to Ohio, to Pennsylvania, to New York, and now Louisiana. And to help talk about how those programs work, I've asked Leandra to share with us a little bit about how she ran our New York facility. We're, we're short-staffed here, so we're 
doing double time. <laughs> you can push it too if you need to. Okay, so Leandra here. Let's walk over by horse. It's always better to have some background stuff going on here. So Leandra Cooper is our facility um, director and trainer here at Merrillwood Farm. And um, she also started our New York facility in 2016, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, I know sometimes people have a hard time understanding why we have multiple facilities and how they operate. And you know, This facility here uh, at Merriworth Farm is the main facility. It's, it's the one that really we've grown the most at. Um, it's easier to get horses in and out of here, which is why we've really grown here the most. But we have multiple facilities all over, so tell us a little bit about how your New York facility ran and how those satellite farms operate. Yeah, absolutely. So um, a lot of the same functions happen. Um, you know, we have horses donated oftentimes, or most of the time, the horses are coming right from the track. So there's the same kind of transition that they need to make just to learn how to be a horse again in the field and, you know, not getting the same sort of uh, really strict regimen exercise programs by jogging in the track. Like, there are a lot of things that horses need to do physically and mentally to transition from that mentality. But um, the way that we function as remote facility is probably the most important thing to note is that we are generally um, operating as just a portion of a larger, larger facility. So almost all of the trainers, if not all of them, have other things going on too. So, you know, here we could spend absolutely every day by an hour taking care of these horses and, and we do. Um, but here, this is the only thing that we do. At our remote facilities, our trainers are super dedicated, basically working overtime doing all of our new vacation functions and doing things like lesson programs or private training or sales and a million things. So those guys are really the superheroes. Um, but I think also every remote facility has a little bit of their own personality for, for lack of a better word. But because the horses who are coming to us are coming generally from the proximal areas, so you might have um, like a um, attitude of uh, like the New York horses are going to be a little bit different than maybe Pennsylvania horses. So we all get sort of like our own group of horses and here we kind of get horses from everywhere. So I, I think it's neat to kind of see how all the different trainers operate a little bit differently because whereas I might have a program to bring a horse from the track and work them through a system to get them ready to be adopted. One of our other trainers at a different facility might have a different program. And we all, I love, once a year we do these trainer retreats and I always love to hear how the other trainers do things because we all operate a little differently. But I think that gives our horses a lot of versatility. We're not just doing things a cookie cutter way. We all kind of customize it to the horses we're getting. but. To so answer your question, I guess, um, the remote facilities do operate very similar to how we operate, but we're they have- We're all under the same umbrella. We're all under the same umbrella of following, uh, for the new vocation horses, they're all um, kind of covered in the same sort of way, um, but there are all these other things going on too. But I think, honestly, that can give them a lot of character as well. So I know um, in some of the horses who are at, facilities where they have lesson programs, then a lot of times those advanced kids are the ones riding them. And maybe they're, the new vocation horses are being ridden at the same time as a lesson is going on. And so you have horses who are really immersed into a like quote unquote normal barn, normal boarding facility. So I think they're a great testament to that these horses can work into basically any atmosphere. So yeah, that's the basis. I mean, we've we've been able to expand our reach here at New Vocations by expanding into multiple facilities, and um, they still fall under our umbrella, our same rules and guidelines and procedures on adoptions and our same contracts and whatnot. So, um, so yeah, when 
when uh, we had some changes here at Merriworth, um, Leandra was running our New York facility and said, hey, I would be interested in coming down and helping in, in Kentucky. Weather. And so we said, absolutely, come on down. So we, we stole our way from our New York facility, which now Amanda Vance runs extremely well. And, um, and Amanda Vance is actually running uh, so we had grown to the point where we had a training barn and then a rehab barn in New York before I came down here and Amanda Vance is actually already working with me um, and communicating and, and knew exactly how we worked already because she was running the rehab portion of it at that point. So I kind of threw all my training horses at her when we work really closely and all of us trainers talk to each other. We all try to know each other. Um, as well as we possibly can and get together and have a good time once a year at our trainer retreat. But um, we all coordinate with each other. Um, we all sort of know the system and operate under the same guidelines. So wanna, they're all getting the same basic uh, wherewithal before they become adoptable. Yeah, very good. Um, well, let's go down here a little bit and look at a couple other horses. They're all trying to calm down now that they realize it's not It's not time. dinner time, I'm sorry. <laughs> this guy was a little upset. He was like making all the noise unequal. Um, and just, you'll notice here on all of our stall fronts, most of them have a name. Uh, ben Masson was um, someone who worked for the TDN who passed away last year. And in his honor, the TDN sponsored this stall for him, which is really, really cool. Um, and so this facility, here at Merriworth Farm, just a little bit of history on that. Um, in 2015, we actually launched our capital campaign to build this facility. And um, the land that we're on is part of a larger farm, which is 1,200 acres. Merriworth Farm is the, the large farm. And um, the Susan Donaldson Foundation owns Merriworth Farm, and they basically um, partnered with us and gave us a free land lease on over 150 acres to build the state of the art uh, retraining facility and across the street we use that we have ours too, which is where we'll go uh, next next Wednesday. So we're really excited and proud of this facility. Um, it's, our, it's our head facility and, and um, we try to spotlight as much as we can around the good things that are happening within the racing industry and within the aftercare um, services that we provide and other programs provide through using this facility and, and different educational opportunities and whatnot. So, um, just to give a little bit of a scope, I thought we'd walk down to the end and kind of slowly come through, and you can zoom around and look at the different horses. Just to give you an idea of the scope of how big New Vocations reaches, um, we take in horses from over 40 different racetracks across the country. And these horses are coming in from anything from smaller tracks to larger tracks. Um, they're coming They're coming from all over. Um, again, we take in both thoroughbreds and standardbreds. Here alone, we just take thoroughbreds. So everything in this barn are thoroughbreds. Just to give you an idea, this guy here traveled all the way from California. That's a Sunset Green Flash. And every horse that's in this barn right now is, <laughs> is either up for adoption or is in training to be up for adoption. So we'll just go through and see some of these this guy right here, Replicator, is about to go up online. So he's at that point where he will soon be up on our website. Or where, which state com. did he come from? Mm, well, that's a great voice. question. I don't remember <laughs> off the top of my head. <laughs> that's the other problem with them coming from all over is that you have a not so great long-term memory. We've got Carson's <laughs> Pass, who is here locally, came locally from a Kentucky farm, but he actually raced in... Um, uh, Puerto Rico and then over here we have Wallace who Wallace came from um, Monmouth Park his last race was at Monmouth and he was um, came over from New Jersey Actually ran in a <laughs> he's still got his winter fur on we did some rehab with him which is why we let him get all fuzzy we'll walk on down here we just saw uh, Presto earlier and uh, Presto um, 
last raced in, at New York, Belmont Park. Came down to Windstar Farm um, for a layup. I know Windstar is part of Horse Country Tours. And then he came over to our program. And then we've got Pepper Lane. I know some of our um, followers have been wanting to see him go. He had a little hoof abscess, so we've, limit, we've waited on him for his meet and greet. But Pepper Lane, where did you come from, babe? New York as well. And our New York, um, the majority of our New York horses are coming through the Take the Lead program, which has been a great partnership for us. Um, they not only provide financial support for each horse that they send us, but they also have their crew um, vet the horses before they send them here and then also organize all the transportation. So we really love the Take the Lead program that NICA has set up. And then everything from, you know, Zapparini, who raced 32 times, to a discreet fantasy, who was here a local horse, was in training but never actually got to race, um, had a mild injury, and so um, he'll be going up for adoption probably here later this month. If there's any questions, you can say them out. None so far. was another ninth of horse that take the lead horse that came from um, let's see where did you last race at Belmont Park as well you had a nice time in the mud last night you have 502 who um, actually raced locally or across the river here at Ohio Belterra and he's a horse that has actually been through our program before um, we can come around here. So once a horse has gone through our program, we're committed to it. And if it, for any reason, isn't a good match within its home, um, we take the horse back or we help the adopter find it a, a new home. And so in his case, that, that was a situation where he needed to be returned to the program. We took him back and now he's back. Is he back up for adoption yet? Or is going back he up to adoption? Actually, was just back. Oh, he just, and he was just adopted again, so. You have some questions. Yeah. Do you guys have your own vets? We actually work with um, four different vet clinics here locally. Um, our ambulatory and main vet is Park Equine. And then we work with several vets over at Haggard. And then we have um, Dr. Burke, who also works with us as well. So we... Um, try to spread the love out a little bit. All of our vets um, work for us at a discounted rate, which is great. And we have normally anywhere from 60 to 70 horses here in Lexington. So um, they're here on a weekly basis, <laughs> if not daily. Good question. What is the average adoption fee? Our average adoption fee is it's $500, I would say, when you average in our standard breads. Our thoroughbreds tend to be closer to a thousand, our standardbreds are closer to five hundred. Thank you for writing me. I would like you to repeat their names also when you're done talking. Repeat about all the them. horses' names? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is Yamazaki. Yamazaki. What a cool name. Yamazaki. He came up from Florida and you can see he has no hair. Very very fine coat. I have a fancy helmet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yamazaki. He's, he's not up for adoption yet, but he will be. We were just about to take his videos when he decided he had a little tiny abscess. So he's already looked, looked better, and hopefully we'll be able to get his video soon. So hopefully in the next couple of weeks he'll be up. Julie, what did you think about riding him so far? <laughs> I only did walk trot with him, but he was absolutely perfect. Okay, and across the hall here we have Legacy of Honor, who's been adopted as well, right? Yes. And he's going to be leaving this weekend. This weekend. Okay, we'll walk down here. We saw Zachary earlier, our stakes winner. He's a little grumpy. 
<laughs> He's angry now. He is. He's angry, yeah. Last raced um, Kentucky Downs, and then across the hall here we've got Coca Roca, who, who we featured yesterday. Yesterday, he. Um, oh, are you angry too? Because I want to meet you. He came from New York, <laughs> also through the Take the Lead program. But his last oh, race was actually at Gulfstream Park, right? And then, last but not least, we have in the summer who um, came from Palm Beach Downs. He was a, a Fletcher trainee. And he's in the Ashford stall. Also on our horse country tours. There he is. In the summer, is definitely one to be watching for. He's such a sweetie. He's another one that um, was returned, uh, was through the program before. And yeah, actually a horse who um, came back because of concerns that they wouldn't be able to go out and take care of him the same way due to COVID. Um, so even situations like that, we're willing to step in and make sure that they can come back into our program. We take care of them, get them up to speed for wherever they need to be to become adoptable again. That's the point that he's at, actually. So he's going to be put back up for adoption too, so. Questions. In your experience, what bloodlines of thoroughbreds produce the best hunters? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, we'll well, let Leandra take that one. I think it's, I mean, we get so many different, I mean, my opinion, we get so many different thoroughbreds and different bloodlines that it's hard to say that there's one more than another, but I do know some people have thoughts that there's certain thoroughbreds that grow, that grow more hunters. What do, you, what do you think? Yeah, that's sort of um, fan theory. So people have just different recommendations depending on what they prefer. It's kind of like even with confirmation, people have different thoughts about what's the best confirmation for the different sport. Um, there are definitely some sporty lines that uh, I can tell you some of my favorites that we look for. Um, like Papiano is a pretty common one that a lot of times creates really athletic babies. Um, Caro, the I'm trying to think, they're blushing, uh, blushing groom, French one. Trying to think of all of them off the top of my head. Feel free if you have any questions about it. I can I can help any approved doctor sort of hand pick ones by bloodline or confirmation. If you want. It's, uh, it would be impossible to name all of them. Some of the probably biggest uh, like fan favorite or super old bloodlines, mm -hmm. but then there are so many different variables that contribute to how a horse is going to um, develop, move, the way that they were brought along, a million different things. So um, there are definitely favorites and little clusters and you can look at like threads online about you know the best bloodlines but they, the truth is um there isn't any ultimate winning secret to it You're, you, a lot of times some of the, the best hunter types we'll see are ones that come from bloodlines you wouldn't expect so um we we treat all the horses more on an individual basis you never know which one's going to be the the new great thing so question though is there any others is there an average length of time from entering your program to adopting it out yeah, our average last year was 90 days and um, so that's sort of the average the, the longest and hardest part of what we do is um, the rehab side of things so um, the majority of the horses that we get in have some type of injury minor from a, a, a muscle soreness to a fracture um, that just simply needs time to, to heal and get better. So, But 90 days is what it was last year. Do you have people who adopt just to have a horse as a pet? Yeah, we do, and we wish that there were more of those because um, we do have horses that we would consider as companion-only animals that, hey, they would be great to mow your lawn, um, but they don't really um, are not able to be a riding horse. And um, we have a handful of those every year, but I do wish we had more. They make good pets. They like 
The thoroughbreds love attention, as you can see. They always come out here, they're all wanting everyone's attention. So uh, that's part of the breed. They're just very responsive. They, they really um, respond to their owners. They get to know their owners. They um, get attached to their owners. So they do make great pets. Are they gelded before they come to you? How is it determined that they will be a good fit into your program, and do you adopt nationwide? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> they are gelded. Um, we do adopt nationwide. And as far as the matching goes, it's really a matter of our filling out our application and then our trainers talking to the doctor and helping them pair up with the right course. I did want to go over, um, before we leave, um, just a couple of numbers and a little bit more information about what we do here in the Lexington facility. Um, we'll walk down to this guy because I like having a horse in my co-anchor here. Um, so you had our average stay. Um, as a program, as a whole for our program, we're taking in or we'll be servicing at least 500 horses on an annual basis. Um, just last year alone, we had over uh, 380 adoptions, and we're on track to do that again this year. Um, just to give you an idea, this month alone, we've already had three, sorry, 37 horses move on to new homes, which is amazing, and we took in 45 horses, and that is all of our facilities. Um, that's uh, just a good good overview of what we're doing here and our what our purpose is as I said earlier is to really provide the aftercare services to the industry and this facility allows us to do that at a scale that we've never been able to do before um, which is really exciting and um, is there any more questions if not I'm gonna go into some ways that you can help or get involved um, they would like to know who the most famous horse we've had is Famous. Well, we don't get very many famous horses. You know, old friends down the road here, um, they're about five miles down the road, um, they're friends of ours. They normally get all the famous horses, where new vocations we get everything else. Um, you know, over at Old Friends, those horses are on show and they do tours specifically to see those horses. So we don't really get too many well named horses. Um, but we've had siblings, we've had, we had mine, not birds, a uh, brother. Um, we've had several horses like Sam P who raced in the Derby. Um, so we've had some siblings of famous horses, but we haven't had um, probably a name that you would recognize. Yeah. So. Yeah, and um, Phantom's brother. Trump. Yeah, brother. So, good questions. Yeah, good. Yeah. But a lot of times, if they're really well known resources, then they go on to stay with the farm that own them. Um, you know, bears will go on to do breeding generally, and then the really great racehorses on time are stallions, and maybe we'll go to stud, um, or we'll retire to a nice thing. But yeah, we don't mind getting the, the failed racehorses. They sometimes make <laughs> They make the great riding horses, great show horses, great pets. They, and they want all the same types of attention. Yeah. <laughs> what is the closest facility to New Jersey? That would probably be our Pennsylvania facility in Hummelstown, Pennsylvania. I believe that's about two hours from New Jersey. Okay. okay. Well, in closing, there's a lot of ways that everybody that's watching can help. Um, the easiest way is to like our Facebook page, become a follower, um, follow us on Instagram, follow us on Twitter. The more you can help, the more you can share our information, whether it's this video or information that we posted about this horse when he goes up for adoption. Um, that's a free way that everybody that's watching can help us spread the word about our horses and our program, and that will speed up the process of us helping these horses find homes, which means we can then take in more horses. So if everybody that's watching and watching this, in the, whether it's live or after it's been filmed, can start liking and sharing our information, that would be huge. Um, second, if you're interested in adopting, we'd love to have you adopt from us. And you can go to our website at newvocations.org, click on adopt, and it'll take you through our whole application and adoption process. And then third, 
Um, we can only run this program and this facility through donations, and our number one source of funding is through private donations. And you can also learn more about how you can um, fill a need on that department through our website by going to newvocations.org and then clicking on donate. So. Again, we appreciate everyone joining us today. I hope everyone's stay, staying safe. Um, we'll continue to answer your questions and the messages after we film this as well or post this. And next week, part two, we're gonna head over across the street and see our rehab barn and also do a little bit of a drive around. Um, today it was a little bit windy, so we're kind of stuck in the barn, but we thought we'd talk history and kind of facts uh, today. But next week we'll do part two, and that'll be over to the rehab barn and a little drive around there with farm. See you next week.